Um, okay, so my talk is the pathologization of cannabis use in the mainstream media. <clears throat> and I've subtitled it with this byline. Mainstream perspectives of pathology or otherness frame much of the public discourse on cannabis and drugs in general. So I will be discussing media representations of cannabis and how mainstream perspectives based on pathology or otherness frame much of the public discourse. I'll suggest ways to rectify these misrepresentations to create a more favorable image and thereby improve the possibilities of changing drug policies. So it's basically a discourse analysis. And who am I? I'm the director of the Drug Lord series. Um, and as Kath pointed out, uh, tomorrow is the world premiere at 12.30 p.m. right here in the Nimbin Town Hall. And Drug Lord 1 will be showing at the Indica Arena tomorrow at 7 p.m. And there'll be a Q&A uh, after, after those shows. Okay, so what does pathologization mean? Um, simply put, it is treating something like it's a disease. Uh, for example, we, um, before homosexuality was legalized, it was treated as a disease and you were seen as deviant if you were homosexual, if you were homosexual, but it's just a natural thing and a percentage of almost any mammal population will be homosexual. So it isn't a pathology, but it was treated as one. Then when homosexual law reform took place in various countries at various times, um, the pathology idea fell away and now it has been normalized. Um, obviously that's not true in many countries in the world, but uh, here in Australia and, and in New Zealand and to varying degrees in states in the United States that has happened. But drug use is still treated as a pathology. It's still treated as something that's abnormal and disease-like or symptomatic of a disease of addiction. And that's very problematic. And the media uses this problematic framing to uh, disparage drug use and drug users which um, <clears throat> I'm trying to illuminate how they do it, which do discourses they use to do this, and thereby you can challenge these discourses and um, uh, question them more effectively, which is basically the purpose of discourse analysis. So the three discourses that I've identified that are, for me, the most prevalent ones in media reporting on drugs and drug users are the discourses of criminality, deviance, and laziness. So you have the criminal, the deviant, and the loser. And um, <clears throat> these are almost stereotypical presentations of drug use and drug users. Uh, now when I use the word deviance, I'm using it almost interchangeably with the word insanity because deviants are perceived as insane and insane people are viewed as deviant. I know it's not quite the same thing, but I'm gonna use these terms interchangeably. Um, in terms of uh, other useful words, toxicomania, is a very useful word. I think Derrida, the deconstructionist, uh, made this word, made up this word, or um, started using it, made it more popular. And basically, <clears throat> it means that the, uh, the drug user has an insane desire for poisonous or intoxicating substances. And so people who use drugs are often thought of as toxicomaniacs. And of course, toxicomania can also refer to alcoholism and, and uh, legal drug use as well, but typically the, the way it's used is to identify people using illicit drugs, and there's these false equivalencies between the legal and illegal drugs, which I'll talk a little bit more about. News media and government beliefs mirror each other and have both adopted a stance that illicit drug use is dangerous and causes further criminality and deviance. Both media coverage and policy direction are disproportionately aimed at these specific stereotypes of drug users to the point whereby simplistic notions have developed at the expense of a broader and more complex discussion, much to the detriment of holistic drugs discourses. Uh, and I'll get through all this academic stuff real quick and it'll become a lot easier to listen to me. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm talking about media representations in terms of reporting and I'm also talking about media representations in terms of advertising and we see common themes within advertising's representations of legal and illegal drugs. Legal drugs and drug use are positively represented in advertising, whereas illegal drug users are presented as risk-bearing outsiders who are actively excluded from society, and the, rep and the representations of them in public service announcements are of the criminal, the deviant, and the loser again. 
And there are sometimes a convergence of news media and advertising, which I'll explain using the example of Reagan's infamous Just Say No campaign from the 1980s. Okay, so to contextualize the origins of these media representations, we go right back to the early 1900s where uh, we see early iterations uh, of these things in newspapers at, of the time. And to explain this, one of the stars of Drug Lord One, Steve Rolls of the Transform Policy Project is, um, I'm just showing an outtake of, of his interview here. The roots of prohibition were intimately entwined with um, issues around race and immigration in the early part of, of, of last century. So it wasn't just Mexican immigrants and the economic depression and marijuana, it was also Asian immigrants and opiates and there was also issues around Negroes and cocaine. There was a whole series of ways in which other drugs that weren't alcohol and tobacco were associated with horrible xenophobic attitudes towards different groups. So different groups were associated with different drugs and scaremongering and fear and xenophobia around those groups and those drugs kind of went hand in hand. Um, and, and the policy responses in terms of prohibitions and enforcement against those drugs became tools of oppression to express some of those racist xenophobic attitudes. So authority used, uh, various forms of authority used the drug laws as a way of oppressing various groups that they, they, they didn't like or, or felt uncomfortable with for whatever reason. So the man perhaps most responsible for originating the international prohibition of cannabis was, sorry, the man most responsible for engineering the international prohibition of cannabis and the federal prohibition of cannabis in the United States was Harry Anslinger. And just so I get an idea of how much detail I need to go into, who has never heard of Harry Anslinger? Okay, a few hands, a few hands, okay. Harry Anslinger was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, effectively the United States' first drug czar. And he was a racist psychopath who got his position in the FBN because his uncle-in-law was the Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon. Um, and Mellon had vested interests in, in many petrochemical processes and patents that he wanted to protect, so he basically told his nephew-in-law, Anslinger, go out and uh, crack down on marijuana and uh, hemp as well, just because they're the same plant, and basically eliminated hemp as a competitor. And, uh, but Hanslinger had his own reasons for pursuing marijuana, and, as well as hemp. Um, he hated black people. He was an inveterate racist. And um, he said things, these are quotes from him, Reefa makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Um, uh, darkies will smoke Reefa and step on white men's shadows. His congressional testimony in the Marijuana Tax Act hearing of 1937, which resulted in the federal ban on cannabis and hemp, uh, he said, and this is a direct quote, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the US and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers and any others. So we're already beginning to see a, a kind of a pathologized view of cannabis use in, in these early statements and these sentiments were picked up by the media. <clears throat> um, so there, were, there was a basically a very volatile mix in US society at that time where these uh, entrenched uh, establishment figures who were very racist were seeing the infiltration of white society by, uh, mainly by jazz and swing musicians because white people were now congregating in the speakeasies that resulted from alcohol prohibition and there was an intermingling of these races for the first time and white people were probably, yeah, definitely having sex with black people more in a, on a different, in a different way to pre previously when it was rape, essentially. Most of the uh, intersex, interracial sex was based on rape before that, white men raping black women. But now white uh, women were in contact with these suave black musicians and probably having sex with them quite often. And this incensed the uh, establishment um, white society of the time. And so there's an element of male versus male sexual competition, which is informing marijuana prohibition to this day. From 75 years ago, unconscious sexual drives 
uh, were leading up to marijuana prohibition. So uh, at, at this is at the same time when cannabis became rebranded as marijuana, the Mexican term for it, um, because Anslinger wanted to obfuscate the fact that he was lobbying for a ban on cannabis, which many Americans were familiar with because it was in apothecaries at that time. So there was this demonization process, and we, we see the beginnings here or of these themes, these um, narratives, the, um, the chaste white woman giving in to seduction by these uh, unscrupulous sleazy dealers. Uh, in cartoon form, you see this dark-skinned other appearing, but only in cartoon form. I have not seen iterations in cinema or in photography of it because I think that was a step too far uh, for the directors of these movies uh, to have a black actor actually enacting a, a kind of a rape scene or a seduction scene with a white actress. I think that was too much for them to, to do. So they were representing these ideas verbally, like in that Anslinger quote, and uh, in cartoon form, like here you can see that, it's not explicitly a black man, but it seems to be. And um, <clears throat> essentially what was happening was they were saying that uh, if you smoke cannabis, you will, you will succumb to the pathology of deviance. So you will become a sexual deviant, you will become a toxicomaniac, uh, you'll lose all control. In the original Reefer Madness film, there's the scene where uh, the one, uh, uh, marijuana addict or dealer beats the other one to death with a stick because he goes through some paranoid delusion. Essentially this is toxicomania being presented as, as truth, but of course it's not true and there's nothing in cannabis that would make you kill another person. But people at the time didn't know that um, and they took these things to be factual and it led up to the federal ban on cannabis and now we're into the 1940s and we're seeing um, Women's hygiene magazines have these planted marijuana stories in them, the same themes, uh, the chaste white woman um, succumbing to deviance because of the influence of marijuana and marijuana users. Marijuana Girl, classic pulp paperback from that time. We see uh, William Irish's pulp paperbacks becoming very popular and now we see in this cover the, the Mexican deranged killer loco weed has taken hold of him and he's murdered a white woman, same themes. But we haven't seen a, an evolution away from these things because if you recall President, uh, sorry, <coughs> hate to say that, Trump, Mr. Trump's uh, presidential candidacy announcement in 2016 where he was using exactly the same themes and he was saying about Mexicans, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Uh, can people remember this quote? I'm quoting him verbatim. Um, that's what he said when he announced for, for the president's, for his presidential run. So we haven't really gotten away from it. It's still present and now the, the president of the United States is actually touting exactly the same ideas. I'm just going through the history uh, of, the, of the 20th century decade by decade. Um, and uh, so next we have the 1950s. We again see the theme of the deviant. We have the beat generation emerging countercultures beginning and people were very afraid of it. They didn't know what Allen Ginsberg and um, Ken Kesey and, and uh, all of these strange sort of counterculture members were about. They knew that they smoked pot and they didn't like them, they didn't like their long hair and their unwashed appearances. So they lumped pot in with that and we see this discourse of deviancy developing through the 1950s and um, marijuana and heroin become conflated at this time. And the term dope, <coughs> um, it was probably used before that, but it was popularized in the press at that time. Dope refers to cannabis, which is kind of derogatory because it means that people who use it are dopey, are stupid, which is, of course, probably no less true than in the general population. Um, and the gateway theory uh, is, is another term which I'll get to, but dope also refers to Heroin, so when people talk about dope, it's confusing whether they're, ref and in the press as well, when they talk about it, you know, the dope debate, you often see these headlines. What are they actually talking about, and why are they, refer if they're referring to cannabis, why are they referring to it in such a derogatory way? Well, it actually comes all the way back to the 1950s and earlier, where Anslinger was purposely planting stories using these terms 
um, intentionally to create this kind of confusion. He was instrumental in the inter international drug prohibition of not just cannabis but all drugs almost um, because he represented the United States at the United Nations and he wrote um, with other people but he was one of the prime authors of the 1961 Convention on Narcotic Drugs which made cannabis illegal in 184 countries. So he was incredibly influential for uh, right up until his death in fact and um, he also invented the term the gateway theory. Now everybody's heard the gateway theory or the stepping stone theory. This is one of Harry Anslinger's own inventions and he planted this idea in the press that cannabis would lead you on to using harder drugs. There's no molecule in the cannabis plant that would cause that to happen. The gateway is actually prohibition, not the drug, because hard and, drug, hard and soft drugs will be sold in the same places. So, um, absurdly, the gateway is created by prohibition and not by the drug itself, and so Harry Anslinger is responsible for much of the, many of the problems we have today with regards to addiction. And uh, then we have the 1960s emerging and the cult counterculture becomes much more prevalent and there's this reaction uh, to it um, embodied by Richard Nixon uh, declaring the war on drugs in 1971. Just after the 1960s, there was the reaction to this moment of enlightenment and it had to be squashed very badly. So now you have kind of more comedic iterations appearing um, Tommy Chong and, and Cheech Marin are parodying those media representations in their film, but it, it was such a successful film, it actually almost uh, informed the culture of the, or did inform the culture of the time, and this, for 10 or even longer years, actually became what many stoners really were like. So, life imitates art, and art imitates life. And at the same time, during the 1970s, we've got um, Barry Obama, who was then the president of the Tum Gang. Um, he was actually one of the most prevalent dealers in his high school. I learned that recently from Dr. Behrman. Told me that this morning. Oh, he's standing, sitting in the back here. Yeah, uh, somebody who knew him back then uh, identified him as uh, one of the two main dealers at his high school. And in fact, um, Obama's dedication in his high school yearbook was to his own dealer, Ray the dealer. Uh, he said, Thank thanks Ray for all the good times. So he didn't say thanks mom or anything like that. He thanked his dealer. Um, 30, 40 years later, he turns into one of the greatest arresters of cannabis users in history. I think he arrested more than George W. Bush during his eight years. So I think he's number one in terms of president, presidents arresting pot users. But Clinton might be number one. Clinton arrested a lot of pot users, and he was also using pot at this time. But these are not stories that the press will concentrate on. These ideas are either played down, made, made into kind of comic relief, comic background stories, or they're not described at all. You won't hear about them unless you start digging to find what the press is not telling you. And uh, I'll get into that in a bit more detail a little bit later using the example of McGruff the Crime Dog. Has anybody heard of McGruff the Crime Dog? No? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll play you a video. So at the same time that um, cannabis is being denigrated by these um, themes of deviance, laziness, and criminality, other drugs that are much more harmful but are legal are being promoted with Contrary discourses, like the nature discourse, like it's so natural to smoke cigarettes, isn't it wonderful? We're out on the lawn and these women are, you know, very wholesome looking as opposed to the representations of cannabis using women where they are um, shown as, as quite degenerate. And if you are shown as kind of in a sexual way, it's okay because uh, it's a white guy who's sedu doing the seduction. So there's a different set of standards involved, both in uh, you know, the, the patriarchal approach to these uh, advertising representations of both men and women, and um, also the drugs that they are speaking about. So at this time, uh, tobacco use is healthy, and um, so is alcohol use as well. Uh, alcohol use is wholesome, it's presented in uh, almost an angelic light with a woman playing a harp and another woman playing an accordion. It's all good for you, there's, there's no, it isn't drug use in other words. But of course these standards have been set down through language. 
And in the 1950s, we see the completion of what I call the daily modern drug cycle, because in the 1950s, you have pharmaceuticals being proliferating through uh, Western society, not just in the United States and Australia and New Zealand, the UK, Europe, you find that now there is a, <clears throat> a, a kind of a drug circuit that many people, probably the majority of people are on every day, and it's all in the name of productivity. So <clears throat> the drugs that have been promoted, the legal drugs are um, the stimulants during the, the daytime cycle when you wake up with caffeine and sugar. Sugar is, uh, it does have the same properties of, of, of a drug, so I'll include it as a drug. You wake up with caffeine and sugar and you keep your e energy levels up artificially with caffeine, sugar, and nicotine, diet pills, uh, such as Obertrol during the 1950s. Nowadays it's Prozac, it's Adderall, it's m very potent stuff. Adderall is actually chemically almost identical to methamphetamine and thousands, millions of, of children even and millions of adults are using this meth-like substance on a daily basis. So uh, that's the stimulant cycle during the day. And then uh, towards evening, after you've finished your workday humdrum, now you need the depressants. And so you kick, it, kick those in with alcohol after work. Sometimes in some of the places that I worked, it was beersies at about 4 o'clock. The, the beers would come out. Um, you are using barbiturates, tranquilizers, and finally uh, maybe some wine over dinner. Uh, and then finally sleeping pills to shut you down. You wake up in the morning and you repeat the drug cycle <coughs> um, indefinitely. Um, and, you know, I guess cannabis is part of many of our drug cycles, but it, it works in a somewhat different way because it's neither a stimulant nor a depressant. It has properties of both, but I'm not claiming to be innocent in any way. Um, so uh, now we are seeing the people who structured this sort of daily drug cycle and structured these media representations of uh, the illicit and the illicit drugs uh, are now actually at the apex of the power structure. Uh, we, had, we had Ronald Reagan, who was a salesman for the tobacco companies for four decades. He took major contributions from pharmaceutical companies, major contributions from alcohol companies, and he became president in the 1980s. And uh, he did many favors to entrench the power of those legal drug producers, and one of the favors he did was to rail against the illegal drugs, um, kind of shutting, again, it's a case of shutting out the competition. So Nancy Reagan's main role in the White House was, uh, she was a drug warrior, and um, her Just Say No campaign um, is, re they're recycling it again. You've got Jeff Sessions, the current Attorney General for the Trump administration, Bringing this out, yeah, we've got to just say no. It's exactly the same words. He's, even, he's not even coming up with original wording for it. He's, he's just reiterating the same failed policy. But if you scratch below the surface, Ronald Reagan was a major recipient of the deadly drugs. Seven million people die, including those who die of passive smoking. Seven million people die every year from tobacco, five million from alcohol, and um, uh, about a quarter of a million from legal pharmaceuticals. So you compare that to cannabis where the number is hovering around zero still. The, and, and his vice president, George W. Bush, was orchestrating flying in hundreds of tons of cocaine at the time into Los Angeles. Uh, when, and, and before that, when he was director of the CIA, he was doing this. So they're actually the major drug dealers. Um, but they're ra railing against um, the pot users, the kind of small-time pot users in the streets and arresting them en masse using this kind of public propaganda campaign. It's, um, that's the actress Rachel Lee Cook. And the reason I chose this particular advert is to, can you hear me when I'm talking out here? Can I just lose the microphone? Okay, I'll keep the microphone. Um, the reason I chose that particular public service announcement was one, it shows, again, the, the theme of deviance um, and the, the theme of laziness. 
um, well, less laziness, but more deviance. But I chose that particular one because Rachel Lee Cook reappears 30 years later <laughs> to tell the truth this time. She was a young girl. She didn't know what she was saying, but... This is your brain. And this is heroin. This is what happens to your brain after snorting heroin. And this is what your body goes through. Wait, it's not over yet. This is what your family goes through. And your friends and your mind. And your job. And your self-respect. And your future. And your life. Any questions? This is one of the millions of Americans who uses drugs and won't get arrested. However, this American is several times more likely to be charged with a drug crime. Imagine it's you. This is the day you get caught. This is your day to sell. This is your first day on the outside. This is your fresh start. Was your fresh start. Here are your job prospects. <gasps> This is your shot at a college degree. Or not. This is your family. This is your debt collector. These are the dreams you have for your children. This is someone else's family. Someone else's life. Someone who used drugs, but was never caught. This is how you feel. The war on drugs is ruining people's lives. It fuels mass incarceration. It targets people of color in greater numbers than their white counterparts. It cripples communities. It costs billions. And it doesn't work. Any questions? Okay, so I chose um, this particular public service announcement and the, the next one because there's such a huge contradiction of, you know, in, in the, it was what, ni sometime in the 1980s, I don't know the exact year, and this was released this year, I believe, so. Um, my math is bad, it's like 35 years or something has passed, and a lot has changed. 30 years has, has um, made quite a difference to, uh, to some of these central figures. Rachel Lee Cook was one of the, that PSA was on probably just as much as that one, the egg brain on drugs one. Those were the two main ones at the time. This is your brain on drugs, and they had the same theme. And I think they were made by the same, yeah, they were. They were made both by the public uh, they were both made by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, who took, in the same year that the Egg Brain on Drugs advert was released, they took $1.1 million from alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceutical companies. So they were basically doing the same thing that Reagan was doing, and that's why <coughs> there was this intermarriage between all of these organizations. They had the same donors. Now, McGruff the Crime Dog um, is a very popular, still, figure from this period um, until recently. Here's McGruff the crime dog back then. Carter proposes major changes to federal drug laws. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. McGruff here. I want you to learn a song that tells people to say no to drugs. Users are losers and losers are users that don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. Winners don't use Just say no. Just say no. Say no. Drugs. Don't use drugs. If you know a user even part of the time, tell them to quit take a bite out of crime. Users are losers and losers are users. So don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. Okay, everybody. If you, if you do use drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be punished. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make room. Nice going. Now teach it to your mom and dad and brothers and sisters and friends to help take a look at the crime. So when we say no to drugs, it'll be clear that we mean absolutely none. This presidential inauguration was actually sponsored by Comtrex, the multi-symptom cold reliever. Um, as I said, he took major donations from all three of the major legal drug uh, industries. Uh, and what happened to, oh sorry, I'll just tell you, this was an excerpt from Drug Lord 1. If you want to see the whole thing in, in context, it'll be on tomorrow night at uh, 7 o'clock. And um, 
So what happened to McGruff the crime dog? <clears throat> That's the point of this story. McGruff the crime dog was uh, is doing like public appearances up until very recently, uh, a couple of years ago it all ended because uh, McGruff the crime dog actor was <laughs> caught with uh, a thousand plants and 27 weapons including a grenade launcher in a bunker underneath his house. Uh, <laughs> So the actor John Morales was arrested in Galveston, Texas um, after a drug sniffing dog, how's that for irony, detected pot when he was pulled over for speeding. Police then found diagrams of two indoor pot growing operations and uh, when they came to his house they found 9,000 rounds of ammunition for an assortment of weapons including a grenade launcher. So uh, he... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's just a very typical example of how much hypocrisy is interwoven in, in drug prohibition. As I, as I was saying before, uh, George H.W. Bush <coughs> was instrumental in the crack epidemic of the 1980s. Um, and if you recall, there was that speech, and well, I showed a bit of it just in that McGruff music video, where he holds up the bag and he says, this is crack cocaine, and uh, don't let your kids do crack cocaine. <clears throat> he was orchestrating the flood of crack cocaine into uh, Los Angeles. Um, it, it was, have, has anybody heard of Gary Webb and Dark Alliance? Yes, okay, well I won't get off on a tangent, but um, read the book Dark Alliance by Gary Webb. Uh, the CIA was, was <clears throat> running cocaine into Los Angeles uh, during the 1980s. And anyway, McGruff um, goes to jail and when that happens, you won't hear about it. It'll only be on alternative news sources. So they won't go, oh wow, look at this story. Isn't, isn't this interesting? Our um, mascot for drug prohibition is actually a drug kingpin. Um, so they'll bury those kinds of stories. And then when something contradicts their narrative, they spin it. They, they will return to their three themes. Um, so in the case of Michael Phelps, uh, when Michael Phelps, who's the greatest Olympian of all time, I think he's won 22 medals, 18 gold medals, uh, making him the uh, world's greatest Olympian. Uh, when he's caught smoking weed, they don't run a story that says, uh, we were wrong about cannabis causing demotiv a motivational syndrome and making you into a loser, as we've been saying for the last hundred odd years. No, no, the, the theme is then just rewoven to say he's so stupid for doing this, he is a loser after all, and um, he is a loser because he's lost all of his sponsorship. So that's how they kind of uh, restructured the story to fit with their narratives. It, it wasn't a case of um, greatest Olympian of all time proves them wrong. They had to, <laughs> they had to spin it to, to conform to, to their storylines. And they do this again and again, and it's not just with these major profile cases like Michael Phelps's. Um, this is Dawn Danby, who was characterized as Granny Ganger. It isn't Granny Gunja. They've deliberately misspelled Gunja to say Ganger to cloud her under this controversy that she may be a gang member, which was completely untrue. Um, that she appears in Drug World 1. If you want to see the full story, Dawn is actually a pharmacist, a retired pharmacist. She owned a pharmacy for 16 years. So she's been trained in medicine. She's a medical health professional. And she knew exactly what she was doing when she grew cannabis. She was doing it for medicinal reasons. And she wasn't selling it. And despite all of those being the facts of the, of the case, the media characterized it completely differently. <clears throat> and they used the discourses of criminality and deviance, saying, she was selling weed and she has got gang connections, both of which were false and she was vindicated in court. And she's a deviant for being an old lady who's selling cannabis. Um, of course, you can approach the story from a completely different angle and say many of the new users of cannabis, people who have recently begun using cannabis, are actually old people just like her and she's not deviant, she's normal because old people find it helps with many of the symptoms of aging. So, but you don't hear that story. That story is, doesn't even, it's, the reporter who wrote this had his angle and it was to make her appear like a criminal deviant. And, and this was repeated on the news, on the radio, 
And the only place that it's dispelled is in my film. So you actually have to watch my film to see her say, no, this is who I really am. I'm a health professional. And um, everything they've said about me is false. Thank you. So these, these, <coughs> these uh, themes, criminality, insanity, discourses, have actually uh, not fallen away and in any sense they haven't even really been weakened except in isolated cases uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later where there is some penetration in the media, uh, where there is some sense and there is some truth coming through. Um, throughout the last decade we've seen uh, headlines like this one, and I, I can't remember which major UK paper this is, but uh, it's the Mirror of the Sun or something. Psycho risk from one joint, front page, cannabis risk in one joint. Of course, that's uh, maybe there's one or two people in the world who might be at risk from one single joint, but it's a very misleading headline, and, and if you um, do the research about the risks of uh, schizophrenia, they're very isolated and there are ways to test for the gene for people who are at risk from schizophrenia. So you can, it's cheaper to test every male in the population, because it's mostly men that, that will suffer from schizophrenia, not women. It's cheaper to test every single male in any given population, no matter how large the country, to identify which of these people are at risk and then educate them and tell them you are at risk from cannabis use uh, by, um, you know, an exponential rate compared to the approach now, which is to keep these people safe <coughs> from the risk of schizophrenia, we criminalize the entire population and we lock hundreds of thousands of people in jail because 0.1% of the population is at risk from schizophrenia. And, of course, it doesn't prevent cannabis reaching these people anyway, so you're not even protecting them at the end of the day but the themes are still repeated in the media ad nauseam, and there's no deeper questioning of it. It's the same ideas that have just been rehashed for the last hundred years. This one I really like because it, now they've married all three themes of criminality, <coughs> excuse me, criminality, insanity, and laziness are all married together in this one story published by the Herald about one of the Paris bombers from a few years back um, whose wife identified him as a lazy pothead. So they seized on this, <laughs> on this guy who may even not have been involved. You don't even know if, if he was responsible or if he was responsible, who put him up to it. So I don't want to say that I know, but I question these stories because many of these major international terrorist incidents I have European or American uh, backing. So I don't know about this one in particular, but I'm just looking at the discourses here, and here's this guy, he's done this horrendous thing, or he's accused of doing this horrendous act of terror, and the personal aspect of his life that they focus on is his cannabis use, and his wife, um, it, it, she, she might not be his wife, we don't know, and she might not have even said this, this might be all concocted, but this is what's coming out, is that this lazy pothead went out and blew up and shot whole bunch of people. So they're marrying all three discourses in this story. Now how do you combat these very nebulous discourses and, and, and um, the effects that they have? Well you have to have contrary discourses that are positive, that are um, educational and that are truthful and that are also professional. And so you have professional PR cannabis people coming to the fourth, and they're quite influential. This one is Cheryl Schumann, who's the proprietor of the Beverly Hills Cannabis Club and a cannabis advertising agency. And it's basically, she's, she's sort of living her message of rebranding the image uh, of cannabis so that it's clean, uh, the stiletto stoner kind of modern um, mover and shaker. It's, it's, it's a, it's a much better image than Cheech and Chong. Um, <clears throat> Mason Tavert, who spearheaded the Colorado legalization movement, is another example of this. Very professional. It's basically he's a professional PR guy. And I think professional PR will lend a lot of um, weight to contradicting these negative, stereotypical discourses that I've been discussing earlier. Mums as well. Mums are extremely powerful and mums get l a lot of media traction. Um, it's very difficult to disparage somebody who's trying to save their sick child. Uh, 
you know, you, you would rightly seem um, like a callous fool. So that's why mums have made such great strides in rectifying the, uh, the negative imaging of can cannabis and drug use in general, but specifically cannabis because cannabis is so useful for the treatment of so many ailments that there are so many of these mums. Um, in the US, you've got mums for marijuana. They get lots of playtime on major networks. Another example from Australia is Cassie Batten. There's dozens and dozens of Australian examples. The most prominent example in New Zealand was Rose Renton, whose son Alex was the very first person to receive an exemption to use cannabis since the 1975 Misuse of Drugs Act was passed. So it took 40, 40 years, it was 2015, 40 years for one single person to be granted an exemption that was written into the act in 1975 that cannabis can be used for medical use can be allowed for medical use with the permission of the Associate Minister of Health or the Minister of Health. But they never granted anybody this exemption till this mum took it to them. Um, in Argentina, you have movements like Mama Cultiva, which in Spanish loosely translated means breastfeed or cultivating mother. They've won. They, just a couple of weeks ago, Argentina legalized cannabis for medical use. So the mums, yeah. For them. A round of applause for the mums. The mums are winning. The mums are actually winning this fight. They're taking it to them. You also have um, positive iterations in mass media sometimes. Sometimes one creeps through, like when Bill Maher smoked a joint on, um, on his show, um, Count, uh, what's it called? Real Time with Bill Maher. And then before that, Zach Galifianakis wrote, uh, uh, lit up a joint. And that kind of, it normalizes cannabis use, which is a positive thing, and it presents an, a different picture to the one that we have been force-fed over the last hundred years. So we have great ambassadors every now and then um, for cannabis use, like Willie Nelson. They contradict the, the stereotype of the loser and the deviant, uh, <coughs> because you can't call Willie Nelson, Willie Nelson a loser. He's won more Grammys than I think any other country music singer. So that's great when, it, when, when uh, you have these instances that contradict the narratives. But every now and then, you have somebody using um, cannabis legalization just as a platform for self-promotion, which I find problematic. Like when Miley, who can easily be classed in with this deviant group, <laughs> um, uh, regardless of how you uh, view her personally or what you think of her music, it's very easy for a mum or a dad to look at Miley and go, ooh, I don't want my daughter to do this. So when Miley lights up a joint at the um, VM, whatever, VMT Music Awards, TMV Music Awards, all the parents who are watching with their young daughters, uh, they, they react against it. And um, that can be problematic. You, you know, if Miley was doing stuff besides this, besides sensationalistic things every now and then when it was convenient to do so, I'd give her a pass, but it seems she's and many celebrities like her are just using the cannabis issue to promote themselves, um, which can have blowback against the movement. And my own contribution uh, in terms of positive imaging is um, like this, po this poster of, of Drug Lord 2, where you see smiling faces of successful professional people. Fiona Patton is one of the stars. And um, <coughs> uh, I'm basically trying to make it more acceptable for people to, to you know, there's no cannabis leaf in there. You know, I'm kind of downplaying it. Um, so it took a long time to actually come up with, with these posters for the second film where, I mean, this first, the first one is like quite dark and you can see the posters at the back there uh, yes. if you want. Oh, I can stand. Um, the, there are posters at the back. Uh, where you can see what the poster for Drug Lord 1 looked like, and it kind of leans towards that negative stereoty stereotyping that I've been talking about. But I knew that I was doing that, and I was going to counterbalance it with this very bright-looking, um, smiley face, professional vibe, um, which is where I want things to head, you know, not just in terms of my own documentary production and, and showing how much good it does, moving away from all the problems with prohibition and looking at the many uses of cannabis, specifically for medical use in Drug Lord 2, I'm, I'm trying to do this rebranding myself. 
Um, and I guess anybody out there who blogs and who writes for newspapers or is on the radio, TV, wherever, um, you can participate in this. You probably are already doing so. Uh, and you can also s identify these themes of deviance, laziness, and uh, what was the third one? Criminality in the media that comes at you and be able to question it um, more effectively through this kind of discourse analysis approach. I don't know how long the Q&A is meant to be, but I've got about 15 minutes left, so I'll just end it there. And, and if you have any questions for me, I will answer them. Thank you very much. I'm sort of uh, not uh, able to see everything as well as I uh, used to be. So I didn't even notice that he was here with the mic. I apologize for that. So earlier today, uh, Eric and I were, uh, were talking, and uh, we didn't get a chance to go into the concept of othering, which I think fits really well with this. And the fact that uh, we have demonized drugs for a couple thousand years and used them as a tool to marginalize uh, discriminate against groups. And I wonder what your opinion is on that, what, what, what your research or what your experience is with the literature, uh, as, or for that matter with the media, in terms of, uh, you already identified the Hispanic uh, in the uh, in, you know, one, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing I need mention to you is that one of those things showing the woman getting injected with cannabis, uh, somebody should let me know the first time they find somebody who's been injected with cannabis, pointed out to me, which I didn't notice, that man is uh, an African American. Uh, and anyway, mean? what do you think about uh, the, the, the whole thing about using drug laws not only for deviance and laziness, but also for marginalizing and discriminating against groups? Oh, it's been a very effective tool in suppressing certain groups. Um, it's been used against Hindus, it's been used against uh, South African natives, it's been used against the Egyptians by the French when they colonized Egypt. Uh, throughout history, if, if you can't um, attack someone because their, their rights might be protected in some way by the law and they have drugs on them, suddenly you have this reason. Uh, and it's being used against minorities here in Australia, uh, Aboriginals, it's being used against the Maori and Pacific Islanders in New Zealand, where you find the arrest rate amongst Maori and probably Pacific Islanders as well, but uh, definitely for Maori is four times higher than whites, seven times more likely to result in a conviction, uh, seven times more likely, or maybe it's four times more likely, I'm not sure which, to result in a custodial sentence. So throughout the chain, and you're less likely to, you know, there, there's just multiple um, layers to it, basically, towards the discrimination against um, minority groups throughout the world. And through, throughout the last mm, 150 years or so, the earliest instance that I can find of cannabis prohibition being codified is actually in South Africa in 1906, <coughs> where uh, the basically the um, white industrialists who controlled the mines uh, didn't like the mine workers using it. And they, they then uh, enforced a, a ban on it and they found that productivity actually went down. Uh, <laughs> and then when they reintroduced it, when they allowed the mine workers to consume it, and they had now extended this banned to other groups as well, but then they made an exception for the original group who were targeted by this law, then they found that productivity went up again. So there's a historical instance of uh, the laziness aspect and the, the amotivational syndrome not playing up in reality. Um, so uh, it, it, cannabis is, is, an, is a very soft target, you know, and then you go forward to the 1970s, the beginnings of the drug war and Richard Nixon, where the peaceniks who were opposing his misadventures in Southeast Asia and all the corruption, all, all the spying, um, they were easy targets because they carried pot with them. And uh, what was his name? Ehrlichman, Joseph Ehrlichman. Can anybody remember his first name? I think it was Joseph Ehrlich, John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman, who was Nixon's chief advisor admitted just recently, about a month or two ago, he said, we didn't make these substances criminal because we thought they were dangerous. We made them, crim we criminalized them because they were being used by blacks and hippies. And we knew all along that we weren't doing anything for public health. 
And you'd think that would get some playtime in the media, that Nixon's own advisor who, who, who was there to write these drug laws for Nixon basically has exposed the real reason for them. You don't hear that at all. It's just a, a, you have to really look for, 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 for these stories. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very nebulous thing. Drug prohibition has uh, a very checkered past. It, it, in, in hardly any instances has it resulted in any positive uh, results for society. Sometimes it has. Some drugs should be banned. Not all should be legal. Um, but, of course, most of them should be. Most of them are much better controlled uh, in the open with a legal regulatory system. I think it doesn't really matter if it intoxicates you uh, or not. Um, you can choose to not be intoxicated by cannabis. You can. You, there are ways to titrate the dose to below the level where it will affect you in any discernible sense uh, psychologically. Um, but I don't see it as problematic if if somebody gains some some additional benefit from, say, the euphoria that is sometimes associated with cannabis, why not? I don't see why a positive side effect should be suppressed. Um, it might not be the intentional, uh, it might not be the intention to get high, but so what if you do? I, I don't see that as a problem. I know that, that some people um, are very worried about children and the children getting high, and the fact is that there's THC in breast milk, so when your little baby is breastfeeding, it's his or her appetite is stimulated, and the child is probably getting high. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, but I'm assuming that, that, that uh, some women have enough THC in their breast milk to get their babies high. Baby doesn't care. Baby doesn't notice. The baby just wants to eat, and the THC helps with that. And I, I think that cannabis has just more potential than almost any other medicine. Probably it, I can say that, can I safely say that as a statement of fact, that cannabis is the most useful plant-based medicine in the world? Uh, can I say that? I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say probably, just to, you know, just as a safety net, and, and all the side effects that, that can result from it are non-lethal. So you're talking about a basically non-toxic substance. Um, I, I don't think it's a problem if people get high off of their medication. <laughs> <laughs>